Today we will consider the question of what modern people can actually gain from spiritual science as we understand it here. We will try to answer this by recalling various things we have become acquainted with during the past winter. Initially, it might seem to us as if this spiritual science were a worldview similar to others current today. It would be easy to suppose that people try to solve the riddles of life by the most varied means at their disposal through religion or science to satisfy what is regarded as their thirst for knowledge, their intellectual curiosity, and that spiritual science is just another of the many modern worldviews, whether they be called materialism, monism, spiritualism, idealism, realism, and so forth. In this view, spiritual science is likewise just something that might satisfy intellectual curiosity, but this is not the case. Rather, we can say that what we acquire through spiritual science endows us with a positive, ongoing benefit for our lives, not merely satisfying our intellect, our thirst for knowledge, but coming to be a real factor in life. If we wish to understand this, we will need to broaden our scope somewhat today. We will have to consider humanity's evolution from a very particular perspective. We have often done this before, but now let us look at this again from another point of view. We have often looked back to times that preceded the great flood of Atlantis, when our forefathers, in other words our own souls, lived in our ancestors' bodies on the ancient continent of Atlantis between Europe, Africa, and America. And we look back to those still more ancient times, which we call the Lemurian Epoch, when the human souls now incarnated stood at a much lower level of existence than they do today. Let us look back to this period again now, seeing that we achieved our current level of sentient life, will life, and intelligence, and indeed our whole form, by virtue of the fact that spiritual beings at a higher level than us in the universe helped form our earthly existence. We have often spoken of the particular spiritual beings who participated in this, of those we call thrones, the spirits of wisdom, spirits of movement, of form, of personality, and so on. These are the great builders and architects of existence, beings who enabled our human race to advance gradually to the stage it has reached today. But now we must be very clear that spirits and beings other than those who advance human evolution also intervened. Beings that are hostile to the progressive spiritual powers intervened in certain ways. And for each of these epochs, both the Lemurian and the Atlantean, and also the post-Atlantean epoch in which we now live, we can identify the spiritual beings who presented hindrances, adversary spiritual beings hostile to those who wish only to help humanity advance. In the Lemurian age, the first we will be concerned with today in relation to earth evolution, luciferic beings intervened in our development. They are, in a sense, hostile to the powers that in those times sought only to help humanity progress. In the Atlantean age, spirits of the figure we call Araman, or also Mephistopheles, opposed the progressive powers. To name them precisely, Aramanic spirits, Mephistophelian spirits are the ones called the spirits of Satan in medieval views, and these should not be confused with Lucifer. In our own times, other spiritual entities will gradually exert an obstructive effect on progressive spirits, and we will return to speak of these later. First, though, let us ask what these luciferic spirits really brought about in the ancient Lemurian age. Today we will consider all this from a quite specific point of view, where really, excuse me, where really did the luciferic spirits intervene 
in ancient Lemurian times. You will best understand what is involved here if you cast your mind back once again to the way in which human beings evolved. You know that the human being evolved on old Saturn when the thrones poured out their own substance, laying down the first germ of the human physical body. We know that subsequently the spirits of wisdom on old sun and the spirits of movement on old moon implanted in him, respectively, the ether or life body and then the astral body. It was now the task of the spirits of form to endow the human being with the eye on earth so that he could, in a sense, become independent by distinguishing himself from his surroundings. But despite becoming independent in relation to the external world surrounding them on earth, human beings would never have gained independence in relation to these spirits of form. They would have remained reliant on them, governed and guided by them as though pulled by strings. That this did not happen resulted from the, in some respects, benevolent effect of the Luciferic being's opposition to the spirits of form during Lemurian times. These Luciferic beings gave us the prospect of our freedom, though at the same time also investing us with the capacity for evil the possibility of deterioration into sensual passions and desires. Where then did these Luciferic spirits intervene? They intervened in what was present, what we had most recently been endowed with, in the astral body that in those days was our inmost being in a certain respect. They gained a foothold in it, took possession of it, if these luciferic beings had not approached us, the spirits of form would otherwise have been the only ones to take possession of the astral body. They would have imprinted it with the powers that endow us with our human countenance, making us the image of God, the image of the spirits of form. The human being would have become all this, but would have remained dependent during his lifetime on these spirits of form and would have stayed so through all eternity. Thus the Luciferic beings insinuated themselves into the astral body, so that two types of being were now at work there, those who help the human being to progress, and those who inhibit him in this unwavering advance, but substitute for this an inwardly consolidated self-reliance. If the Luciferic beings had not approached us, our astral body would have retained its state of innocence and purity. No passions would have arisen in us to make us desire things only found upon the earth. We can say that the Luciferic beings made passions, drives, and desires denser and lower in nature. In the absence of Luciferic beings, Humankind would have longed continually to ascend again to its home in spiritual realms from which it first descended. The human being would have felt no inclination toward what surrounds him on earth, could not possibly have become interested in earthly impressions. It was the Luciferic spirits who awoke this interest in him. They drove him into the earthly sphere by occupying his inmost being, his astral body. But what prevented human beings from lapsing entirely from the spirits of form at that time or from higher spiritual realms in general? What was it that prevented him from falling entirely under the sway of their interest in and desire for the sensory world? The spirits who enable us to progress reached for a remedy which involved imbuing the human being with something that would not otherwise exist in him. They imbued him with sickness, suffering, and pain. This became the necessary counterweight to the deeds of the Luciferic spirits. The Luciferic spirits gave us sensual desire. The higher beings, by adding sickness and suffering to the array of sensual desires and sensory interests, introduced a remedy to prevent us falling entirely under the sway of this sensory world. 
Thus the world contains for us as much suffering and pain as mere interest in the physical sensory world. These balance each other fully, with neither having the upper hand. The sum of sensual desires and passions is precisely matched by sickness and pain. This resulted from the mutual influence of the Luciferic spirits and the spirits of form in Lemurian times. If these Luciferic spirits had not come, we would not have descended as early as we did into the earthly sphere. Our passions and desires for the world of the senses also meant that our eyes were opened sooner to perceive the whole compass of sensory existence. If things had unfolded smoothly, as the progressive spirits intended, we would only have perceived our earthly surroundings from the middle of Atlantean times onward. And we would have perceived them spiritually, not as we do today, but such that our surroundings would everywhere have revealed themselves as the expression of spiritual beings. Because we were transposed prematurely into the earthly sphere and our earthly interests and desires drew us downward, things unfolded in a different way from what would otherwise have occurred in the middle of the Atlantean period. Because of this, the Aramonic spirits, whom we can also call Mephistophelian spirits, interfered in the human faculty of seeing and understanding. In consequence, we fell into error into what can really first be called quote, conscious sin, close quote. The host of Aramonic spirits acted upon us from the middle of Atlantean times. What was the nature of the seduction exerted on us by this host of Aramonic spirits? They darkened our gaze, so that we failed to look through the veil of what we regard as material substance in our surroundings to the spirit as the true foundations of materiality. If human beings saw the spirit in every stone, plant, and animal, they could never have fallen into error and thus into evil. If the progressive spirits alone had worked upon us, we would have been preserved from the illusions to which we always succumb when we base everything on what the world of the senses tells us. What remedy to this temptation was found by the spiritual beings who wished to support us in our progress and further development. How did they counter such error and sensory illusion? They took steps to enable us, now properly for the first time, to gain from the sensory world the possibility of overcoming error, sin, and evil by bearing and working out our karma. Naturally, this only occurred gradually. But the powers underlying this development originated here. Thus, while beings called on to redress the seduction of Luciferic beings introduced pain and suffering into the world, and of course also death, which is related to it, those whose task it was to make good what results from error about the sensory world gave us the potential through our karma of dispelling all error again of once more erasing all evil that we ourselves perpetrate in the world. What would have happened if we had irredeemably succumbed to evil and error? We would then have gradually united with this error, you can say, and have lost all capacity to develop further. You see, with every error, every lie, every illusion, we throw an obstacle upon our further path. Our progress would always be pushed backward by the obstacles of every error and sin if we were not capable of correcting these. In other words, we would then actually be unable to reach the goal of human evolution. It would be simply impossible to attain humanity's goal if the restorative counterforces of karma did not act. Imagine for a moment that you do something wrong in one life. This wrong that you do, if it just stays there unremedied in your life, is tantamount to losing the forward step you would have taken if you had not committed the wrong. With every wrong or unjust act you do, you would lose a step forward. 
and these acts would all add up to retrogression, to slipping backward. If there were no possibility of raising ourselves above error, we would ultimately get bogged down by it. But the boon of karma arose. How does this benefit us? Is karma something we should fear, should be frightened by? No, it is a power for which we ought actually to feel grateful to universal dispensation. You see, karma tells us that if we have done something misguided, mistaken, we must reap what we sow, for, quote, God is not mocked, close quote. The result of our error is that we must remedy it. Having done so, we have excised it from our karma and can take further forward steps. Without karma, we could not possibly advance during our lives. Karma grants us the boon of requiring us to make good everything retrograde that we have done, to eradicate it again. Thus karma arose as the consequence of Araman's deeds. And now let us delve further. In our time we are approaching an age when other beings will engage with us, beings who will increasingly intervene in the human future, the human evolution that still awaits us. Just as the Luciferic spirits intervened in the Lemurian age and the Aramonic spirits in the Atlantean age, so beings will gradually also intervene in our own times. Let us be quite clear for a moment what kinds of beings these will be. The entities intervening in Lemurian times, as we saw, settled in the human being's astral body, drawing his drives and desires down into the earthly sphere. But, to be more precise, what exactly did these luciferic beings settle in and fasten upon? You will only be able to understand this if you recall the configuration of human nature as set out in my book Theosophy. There we find a necessary distinction, initially, between our physical body, ether or life body, and our astral body, or, as I have called it there, the sentient or soul body. In studying these three aspects, we find they are precisely the same as the three given us before we embarked on our lives on earth. What is referred to as the physical body acquired its initial form on old Saturn, while the ether body first developed on old sun, and the soul or sentient body on old moon. During our current earth stage of evolution, the sentient soul was gradually added as, really, an unconscious transformation or adaptation of the sentient body. Lucifer rooted himself in this sentient soul, insinuating himself into it and settling down there. There he sits. Then the mind soul developed also through unconscious adaptation of the ether body. I have gone into greater detail on this in my treatise entitled The Education of the Child. In this second aspect of the human soul, the mind soul, thus in the reworked part of the ether body, Araman rooted himself. There he sits and leads humankind to false judgments about the material world leads us into error, sins, and lies, to everything, in fact, that derives from the rational or mind-soul. For instance, whenever people embrace the illusion that matter is the be-all and end-all, this can be attributed to the suggestive influences of Araman, of Mephistopheles. The third in this progressive sequence is the consciousness soul, which consists of an unconscious rework reworking of the physical body. You will remember how this adaptation arose. Toward the end of Atlantean times, the head's ether body merged completely with the physical head, gradually transforming the physical body to make the human being a self-aware entity. Basically, we are still working today on this unconscious adaptation of the physical body on the consciousness soul, and in the forthcoming period, the spiritual beings called the Azuras, will insinuate themselves into this consciousness soul and thus also into what we call the human eye capital.
for the I comes to expression in the consciousness soul. The Azuras will develop evil with an intensity far greater than did the satanic powers of the Atlantean age or the luciferic spirits of Lemurian times. The evil which the luciferic spirits brought upon us at the same time as granting us the boon of freedom is something we will shed entirely in the course of earthly evolution. The evil brought by the Aramonic spirits can be dispelled in the unfolding of karmic lawfulness. But the evil which the Azuric powers bring cannot be expunged in the same way. Whereas the good spirits brought us pain and suffering, illness and death, so that we might evolve upward despite our capacity for evil, and whereas they brought us the possibility of karmic redress to counterbalance aramonic powers and compensate for error, things will not be so straightforward in relation to the Azuric spirits as earthly evolution progresses. This is because these Azuric spirits take hold of our deeper inmost being, the consciousness soul with the I, and cause this I to unite with the sensory carnal nature of the earth. One portion of the eye after another will be torn from it. And as the Azuric spirits increasingly settle and take root in the consciousness soul, we will increasingly be obliged to leave parts of our existence behind on the earth. What succumbs to the Azuric powers will be irretrievably lost. This does not mean that our whole being must succumb to them, but the Azuric spirits will excise portions of the human spirit. In our age these Azuras are announcing themselves in the prevailing outlook we can call that of merely sensual life, the forgetfulness of all true spiritual beings, realities and worlds. We can say that so far the Azuric temptation remains more theoretical. So far their deception is a widespread suggestion that the I is merely an outcome of the physical world alone, and their seduction one which leads people to a kind of theoretical materialism. But as things continue, and this is becoming increasingly apparent in the wasteland of sensory passions that rain down more and more upon earth, they will darken the gaze of humankind for spiritual beings and spiritual powers. People will know nothing and will not wish to know anything about a world of spirit. More than just subscribing to the doctrine that the loftiest ethical ideas are just highly developed animal drives, that human thinking is merely a transformation of animal senses, that in form we are closely related to animals and that our whole nature derives directly from them, human beings will come to live according to this view, will see themselves in this way and act accordingly. Today, after all, no one actually lives as if their nature derives from animals, but this worldview will certainly come and will result in people also really starting to live like animals descending into merely animal instincts, drives and passions. And in some of the phenomena we need not describe further here, manifesting particularly as empty orgies of pointless sensuality that occur in large cities, we can see already the grotesque hellfire of the spirits we call the Azuras. Let us direct our gaze back in time once more. We saw that suffering, pain, and also death were bestowed on us by the spirits who wish us to advance. In the Bible, this is clearly announced in the phrase, quote, In pain thou shalt bring forth children. Close quote. Here, death enters the world, and these things were a destiny brought upon us by the powers opposed to the Luciferic. Who bestowed karma upon us, and who made it possible at all for karma? to exist for us. You will only understand what is now said if you do not adhere pedantically to fixed concepts of earthly time. In terms of earthly time, people believe that whatever happens at any point 
can only cause an effect at a subsequent moment. But in the world of spirit, the effects of what happens are apparent beforehand. These effects already exist before their cause. To what is the boon of karma due? What did this benevolent deed of karma spring from in our earth's evolution? It comes from no other power in all evolution than from Christ. Although Christ did not appear until a later time, he was always present in the earth's spiritual sphere. Already in the ancient Atlantean oracles, the priests of the oracle spoke of the spirit of the sun, of Christ. The holy rishis in the ancient Indian epoch spoke of Vishwakarman, and in Persia Zarathustra spoke of Ahura Mazda. Hermes spoke of Osiris, and Moses, the precursor and prophet of Christ, spoke of the power whose eternal nature counterbalances all the natural world, the power that lives in the Aja Asha Aja. Sorry for my pronunciation. I am that I am. All of them were speaking of Christ. But where was he to be found in these ancient times? Only where the eye of spirit could penetrate, the world of spirit. He was always present and active in and from the world of spirit. Readers aside, uh, that was the readers aside saying, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, not Rudolf Steiner, sorry. Uh, readers aside, over. He it was who before he ever appeared on earth bestowed from above upon the human being the possibility of karma. Then he himself appeared on earth and we know what he became for us through doing so. We have described his workings in the earthly sphere itself and the significance of the event of Golgotha. We have also described his effects upon those who were not incarnated in an earthly body at the time the event of Golgotha occurred, but were then in the world of spirit. We know that at the moment when Christ's blood flowed from his wounds on Golgotha, the spirit of Christ appeared in the underworld, and we saw that the whole world of spirit was lit up and illumined. We saw that Christ's appearance on earth is the most important event for the world too, which we pass through between death and a new birth. The effect that emanates from Christ is a thoroughly real one. We need only ask ourselves what would have happened to the earth if Christ had not appeared. The image of a Christless earth is one that can vividly show us the whole significance of Christ's appearance. Let us assume for a moment that Christ never appeared and the event of Golgotha did not occur. Before Christ's appearance, the souls of the most advanced human beings had acquired the profoundest interest in earthly life and experienced the spiritual world in a way entirely in accord with the Greek saying, quote, better a beggar in the upper world than a king in the world of shades, close quote. In the world of spirit, before the event of Golgotha, souls felt themselves alone and shrouded in obscurity. At that time, the spiritual world was not transparent in its full, radiant clarity for those who passed through the gate of death and found themselves there. Each soul felt alone, isolated, as though surrounded by a wall that cut each off from the other. And this experience would have grown continually stronger. Human beings would have become hardened in their eye, would have been completely thrown back on themselves, none finding the bridge to others. At each new incarnation, the egotism that already existed in great measure would have grown still more pervasive. The whole of earth existence would have turned people increasingly into the crassest egotists. Nowhere on the globe would there have been any prospect whatever of a sense of fraternity or inner accord arising in human souls. For every passage through the spiritual realm would have reinforced and consolidated the ego. This is what would have happened on a Christless earth. We owe to Christ's appearance and the event of Golgotha the capacity of one soul to slowly find its way to the other, 
our capacity to include all humanity in the great encompassing power of fraternity. Thus Christ appears as the power who enables us to make proper use of earthly existence, or in other words to shape karma in a fitting way. Karma, you see, must be worked out on earth. To the workings of the Christ event, the presence of Christ in the earthly sphere, we owe our ability to find the strength to improve our karma as we should in earthly physical existence and engage in ongoing further evolution. Thus we see how the most diverse powers and beings work together in the course of humanity's evolution. Previously we only indicated in general that if Christ had not come to the earth, humankind would have sunk into error. We can see in very clear, precise terms now that human beings would have grown inwardly ever harder, becoming something like self-enclosed spheres, globes, each for himself, and knowing nothing about other beings. Error and sin would have driven humankind into this state. Christ is the guiding light who leads us out of error and sin and enables us to find the path of ascent. Now let us ask what human beings lost when they descended from the spiritual world and became enmeshed under Lucifer's influence and then under Araman's influence in error, illusion and lies in relation to the earthly world. They lost direct vision of the spiritual world insight into and understanding of it. What therefore will they regain? They should regain full understanding of the spiritual world. And the deed of Christ can only be grasped by self-aware human beings when they gain full understanding of Christ himself. The power of Christ certainly exists. Humankind did not bring it to earth, for it came through Christ. Through Christ, the possibility of karma entered humanity. But now human beings, as self-aware beings, must recognize the nature of Christ and his connection with the whole world. Only by this means can each person really act as an I. Following Christ's life on earth, what do we actually do if, rather than just allowing the power of Christ to work upon us unconsciously, Rather than just being satisfied that Christ lived on earth and will redeem us, ensuring somehow that we progress, we undertake to perceive the real nature of Christ, how he descended, and to participate in Christ's deed through our own spirit. What is the significance of doing this? Let us remind ourselves that we descended into the sensory world because Luciferic spirits insinuated themselves into the human astral body. And that although this meant we could succumb to evil, it also enabled us to achieve self-aware freedom. Lucifer dwells in the human being, and as it were, fetched him down to earth, enmeshing him in earthly existence. He did so by first leading earthward the passions and desires present in the astral body, so that Araman could then also attack us in the etheric body, in the mind-soul. But then Christ appeared, and with him the power that can lead us upward again into the world of spirit. And now, if we wish, we can perceive Christ. Now we can gather together all wisdom in order to recognize Christ. And what does this mean? Something of vast importance. When we perceive and acknowledge Christ, when we really allow ourselves to absorb the wisdom that tells us what he is, to penetrate this with understanding, then we redeem both ourselves and the Luciferic beings through knowledge of Christ. If we are merely satisfied that Christ once lived on earth, we allow ourselves to be redeemed unconsciously, and then we would never help redeem the Luciferic beings. These beings who brought us freedom also enable us to freely use this freedom to understand Christ. Then the Luciferic spirits are purged and purified 
in the fire of Christianity. And the sin the Luciferic spirits afflicted earth with is transformed from a sin into a boon, a benevolent deed. Freedom is achieved, but is taken into the spiritual sphere as a deed of benevolence. That we are able to do this, are capable of perceiving and understanding Christ, and that Lucifer is resurrected in a new form and can unite as the Holy Spirit with Christ is something Christ himself prophesied to those around him when he said, quote, You can be illumined with the new spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Close quote. This Holy Spirit is none other than the one through whom we can also come to understand the real nature of Christ's deed. Christ did not wish merely to work and act, but also desired to be understood. It is therefore integral to Christianity that the Spirit who inspires us, the Holy Spirit, is sent to humankind. Whitsun is spiritually connected with Easter and cannot be seen apart from it. This Holy Spirit is none other than the resurrected Luciferic Spirit, reborn now in purer, higher glory, the Spirit of independent wisdom imbued insight. Christ himself prophesied the advent of this Spirit after him, and our further work must accord with it. What furthers this Spirit? The world stream of spiritual science does so, when properly understood. What is this world stream? It is the wisdom of the Spirit which raises to full consciousness what would otherwise remain unconscious in Christianity. Lucifer resurrected and transformed into good precedes Christ with a flaming torch. He bears Christ himself. He is the bearer of light and Christ is the light. The name Lucifer means light bearer. That is precisely what the spiritual scientific movement is to be and what it signifies. And those who have understood that humanity's progress depends on understanding the great event of Golgotha are united in the great guiding lodge of humanity as the masters of wisdom and of the harmony of feelings. And as long ago the tongues of fire descended upon the group of apostles in a living universal symbol, so the Holy Spirit sent by Christ himself holds sway as light over the lodge of the twelve. The thirteenth is the leader of this lodge. The Holy Spirit is the great teacher of those we refer to as the masters of wisdom and the harmony of feelings. They are therefore the ones through whom its voice and treasures of wisdom flow down to humanity on earth in one or another stream. The wisdom gathered together by the spiritual scientific movement in order to understand the world and the spirits dwelling there flows from the Holy Spirit into the Lodge of the Twelve. And ultimately this is what will gradually lead humanity to self-aware, free insight into Christ and the event of Golgotha. Engaging with spiritual science thus means understanding that Christ sent the Spirit into the world and that spiritual science is intrinsic to true Christianity. People will increasingly come to realize this, and they will then see that in spiritual science they have a positive treasure for life. Spiritual science enables us to gradually become conscious of Christ as the Spirit illuminating the world. And the consequence of this will be our human progress here on this globe, in the physical world, in terms of ethics, in terms of the will, and in terms of the intellect. Passing through physical life, the world will become ever more spiritualized. Human beings will become better, stronger, and wiser, and will wish to look ever more deeply into the deep ground and sources of existence. They will take with them as fruits what they accomplish and master here in this life of the senses, bring it with them into supersensible life, and then bring it back with them again from supersensible life at each new incarnation. 
In this way the earth will increasingly become an expression of its spirit, of the Christ spirit, and understanding for spiritual science will gradually arise from the world's foundations. People will come to see that spiritual science is a real positive power. Today, in various ways, humanity is close to losing the spirit entirely. In a recent public lecture, I highlighted the fear people feel of genetically transmitted diseases, of problematic inherited traits. This fear is part and parcel of our materialistic age. Yet, is it enough to bask in the illusion that we can dismiss this fear? Certainly not. Someone who does not bother with the world of, the sp of spirit and does not imbue his soul with what can flow from the spiritual scientific movement succumbs to what comes from the physical line of descent. Imbuing ourselves with what we can receive from the spiritual stream of the science of the spirit is the only way to master what descends through the line of inheritance, rendering it insignificant and gaining victory over all the inhibiting powers that approach us from the external world. We do not achieve mastery over the sensory world by philosophizing it away, by endless debate, by stating that the spirit exists, but instead by permeating ourselves with this spirit, really absorbing it, really having the will to acquaint ourselves with all its aspects and details. Then also people will become ever healthier within the physical world through spiritual science. For this will itself become the medicine which renders us hale and sound in the physical world. The real power of spiritual science will become ever clearer if we consider what we enter when we pass through the gate of death. This is something very hard indeed for modern people to gain insight into. Why, they wonder, should they bother about what happens in the world of spirit? At death, they think, they'll be going there anyway and that will be soon enough to see and hear what is there. You can hear countless versions of this same, somewhat comfortable view. Why oh, bother with the spirit before I die? I'll find uh, all that out when I get there. Whether or not I'm preoccupied with it before I die won't alter my relationship with the spiritual world. But this is not so. Those who think like this will find a dark, gloomy world after death. It will be like finding it hard to discern or distinguish anything much of the worlds of spirit described in my book in Theosophy. You see, it is only by connecting our soul and spirit with the world of spirit while we dwell here in the physical world that we become able to perceive the spiritual world. We prepare ourselves to see it while here. The world of spirit is there and the capacity to see it must be developed here on earth, for otherwise you will be blind in the spiritual world. Spiritual science gives you the power without which you cannot consciously penetrate the spiritual world at all. If Christ had not appeared in the physical world, human beings would sink down and succumb to this world, would be unable to enter the world of spirit. But now we can be raised through Christ into the spiritual world so that we can become conscious there and perceive it. This also requires us to know how to connect with what Christ sent, with the Spirit, for otherwise we remain unconscious. We must acquire our immortality, for unconscious immortality is not yet immortality. Master Eckhart put this very beautifully when he said, quote, What use to man to be a king, if knowing not he is this thing? Close quote. By this he meant, what use is the spiritual world to us, if we do not know what the world of spirit is? You can acquire the capacity to perceive the spiritual world only in the physical world. Let that give heart to those who ask why human beings ever descended to the physical world in the first place. The human being descended so that he can come to perceive the spiritual world here. 
He would remain blind to it if he did not if he had not descended to earth, acquiring here the self aware nature with which he can return to the spiritual world, so that it lies open and radiant before him. Spiritual science, therefore, is not merely a world view, but something without which the immortal part of us cannot know anything of the immortal worlds. It is a real power, and it flows as reality into our soul. As you sit here engaging with and studying spiritual science, you not only gain knowledge, but grow into being something that you would not otherwise become. That is the difference between spiritual science and other worldviews. All other worldviews relate to knowledge, while anthroposophy relates to human existence. If we put things together in the right way, we will have to see it like this. Precisely in this light, Christ the Spirit and all of spiritual science appear intrinsically and inwardly connected. In the face of this living context, everything that can be said in superficial terms today, such as that a Western esoteric school staunchly opposes an Eastern one, pales into insignificance. There are not two types of esotericism, nor any antagonism between Western and Eastern spiritual science. There is only one truth. And if someone asks us why, if Eastern and Western esotericism are one and the same, Eastern schools do not acknowledge Christ, we can reply that it is not up to us to give an answer. We have no obligation to reply to this, for we acknowledge the full scope of Eastern esotericism. If they ask us whether we acknowledge what Eastern esotericism says about Brahma and Buddha, we will reply that we certainly do. We understand what is meant when Eastern schools tell, tell us that Buddha rose to his lofty eminence by a particular path. We do not negate a single one of all the Eastern truths, and insofar as they are positive, we fully acknowledge each and every one. But should they deter us from acknowledging something that exceeds their scope? Certainly not. We acknowledge what Eastern esotericism says, but this does not prevent us from also at the same time acknowledging Western truths. People, supposedly learned scholars, disparage the view of Orientalists that the Buddha succumbed through excess consumption of pork. But we can gain insight into the deeper meaning of this, that the Buddha imparted too much esoteric wisdom to those around him at the time, so that this satiation led to a kind of karma for him. And then we can acknowledge this, can see that of course there is deeper esoteric wisdom underlying the statements made by Oriental esotericists. But if someone tells us that it is beyond comprehension that John the Divine received the book of the Apocalypse on Patmos amidst thunder and lightning, we reply, all who know what this signifies also know it to be true. We do not deny one truth, but nor can we accept denial of another. It does not occur to us to contradict the statement that the astral body of Buddha was preserved and later incorporated into Shankarakarya, Shankarakarya, but this cannot prevent us from teaching that the astral body of Jesus of Nazareth was preserved, appearing in a certain number of images or imprints incorporated into various figures who worked to further Christianity, such as St. Francis of Assisi or Elizabeth of Turingia. We do not deny a single truth of Oriental esotericism. At most we may refute what it negates in Western esotericism. And so if people ask us why the Eastern stream negates what we say, and why opposition exists between Eastern and Western schools, we must refrain from replying. It would only be up to us to answer if we had any dispute with Eastern, excuse me, with Eastern esotericism ourselves. We don't. The person who denies or negates something is the one obliged to answer such a question, not the one who affirms and acknowledges. This is quite self-evident. And from this perspective, over the next few weeks, 
you will be able to trace the connection between spiritual science and the event of Golgotha, raising into a higher sphere the whole mission and vocation of the world movement for spiritual science through insight into the fact that this spiritual science is the realization and enactment of the inspiration and power which Christ named the Spirit. And so we see how powers work together in the world, how all that apparently resists and opposes humanity's progress later turns out to be of benefit, a boon. And likewise we see that in the post-Atlantean era, passing from one age to the next, the spirit who liberated human beings will reappear in a new form. The leading light-bearer Lucifer will be redeemed. For everything in world dispensation is good, and evil only prevails for a certain period. This is why we can only believe in never-ending evil if we confuse the temporal with the eternal. We will never understand the nature of evil unless we ascend from the temporal to the eternal realm.